Welcome to MENA Dialogues, a series of interviews with leading scholars, artists, and writers produced by the Middle East and North African Studies Program at Northwestern University. This installment of MENA Dialogues features an interview with Trita Parsi about his book, Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. Parsi is the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council, NIAC, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to strengthening the voice of Iranian Americans and promoting greater understanding between the American and Iranian people. Parsi is frequently consulted by Western and Asian governments on foreign policy and has worked for the Swedish Permanent Mission to the United Nations, where he served in the UN Security Council and the General Assembly's Third Committee, addressing human rights in the Middle East. He is the author of three books, Treacherous Alliance, The Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel, and the United States, A Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, and Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy, which Andrew Basevich called the authoritative account of one of this century's pivotal developments. In 2010, Parsi won the Gromeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order. The host is Brian Edwards, Crown Professor in Middle East Studies and Director of the MENA program at Northwestern University. He's the author of two books, Morocco Bound, Disorienting America's Maghreb from Casablanca to the Marrakesh Express, and After the American Century, The Ends of U.S. Culture in the Middle East. This conversation took place on December 11th, 2017 at Northwestern University. Thanks, Trita, for joining us. Thank you for um, having me. It's great to have you here. And, you know, first of all, let's start by talking about the book. Um, the book is, you know, as, as, um, as has been promised, a, both an important um, study of this, the Iran deal, um, that's, that has so many attributes, including coming out very quickly after the events that are described themselves, but also just based on interviews with such a wide range of sources, both on the Iranian side and the U.S. side, um, and, you know, just having kind of a level of access that's just really uh, very exciting. As one of your um, blurbs uh, puts it, it's also kind of a dramatic story. It's a bit of a page turner. And, <laughs> you know, I found myself, you know, wanting to see what was going to happen next. Um, so first, um, can you just tell us a little bit about the experience of writing the book and, and, and what your sources, you know, were they eager to talk? Was it? So I was in a bit of a unique position because I was um, an informal advisor to the Obama administration. My organization had been very much pushing for diplomacy with Iran for more than a decade. Uh, so we were, you know, in, in line with diplomacy even before Obama became president. So um, I had the fortunate, um, the, the luck to be able to be called upon by the White House and throughout these negotiations. And at the same time, I had access to the Iranians because of my previous books. And many of the key people back then ended up becoming the leaders of the Iranian negotiating team, Zarif in particular, the, the foreign minister. So the book was kind of coming to my mind throughout the negotiations because I was there for many of the different rounds. I had access to both sides. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Zarif in the midst of the negotiations on many occasions, uh, as well as with the U.S. team. And some of it is also I included what was happening in the White House when I was there myself in some of those conversations. Right. Of course, keeping some details out. But So I had a lot of that in mind already. And part of the reason I wanted to write the book was precisely because of, to me, it was a bit of an American rediscovery of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. After years of the Bush administration treating diplomacy as a sign of weakness, it was a uh, a truly, in my view, heroic uh, effort by the American diplomats going into something that had such a little chance of success from the outset. Mm -hmm. The idea that you could strike a deal with the Iranians, that they would show up at mm -hmm. the table, that they would hold their end of the bargain, etc. Uh, and a lot of tremendous diplomatic creativity from all sides. And I thought it would be valuable to tell that story about how this international crisis 
that truly was on the verge of a military confrontation actually was resolved peacefully through diplomacy without a single shot being fired, mm -hmm. without a single angry e tweet being mm -hmm. sent out 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, I think it would be valuable for us to mm -hmm. relearn that right. because we're going to need it soon. Yeah. No, the book makes a, a powerful argument for the importance of diplomacy. And you know, before we get into the, the history of, of U.S. and Iran relations that leads up to that, but I just want to pick up on that point you, that you made. I mean, it, it's a, in a way, I mean, it's very graceful to read it and, and it's got this dramatic quality, but there's a bit of a kind of hybrid quality to it. On the mm -hmm. one hand, you're a participant and an observer. Um, on the other hand, you're describing, you know, as a most diplomatic historian, um, discussions and events that are happening. Um, so, you know, how did you, you know, negotiate the participant observer part? You know, yeah. anthropologists in our audience, you know, find that to be a very fraught kind of <laughs> encounter that you're both observing something that you're a part of. Was, you know, did that, was that pre present itself to you at the time or later when you're writing as a No, it, it was throughout. Um, I think it was a little bit more when it came to what was going on on the Hill because that's where I think the participation, participation role was a little bit stronger. Uh, and I thought that what I need to do is just be completely upfront in the book and explain my own role in this. Uh, you know, by now, I think those who study this issue know quite well where I stood on this issue. So uh, even though I'm upfront about it, I, I don't think it was a mystery to anyone. I mean, the title says The Triumph of Diplomacy, so most people figured out I'm in favor of the deal. Right. Um, but I thought it was, nevertheless, um, it is challenging, but, but there's also this issue that there's almost no one that could have written this story mm -hmm. this early without having been a participant. Right. It's a different story 30 years from now when there are a lot of documents that have been classified, become unclassified, and we may be able to learn much more about what was going on behind the scene. But at this moment, mm -hmm. there was no neutral observer that was there and that was mm -hmm. kind of in the inside and, and had that unique combination because there's a lot of people who probably have better access to the White House than I did, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. There may be some people on the U.S. side who have better access to the Iranians, but that combination of being able to talk to both at the same time, mm -hmm. as well as with the Europeans, etc., I feel like there's no one else that had that combination of access. And as a result, uh, despite the challenges and um, you know the, how do I balance that role, I thought it was an important story to tell. Well, there's some kind of yeah, du doubling there of the um, diplomatic role that you, as an author, then play kind of back and forth between the two sides that gets mirrored in, in the way you had to write the, the, write the book. All right, now, you know, on the one hand, we started by talking about how, how quick, I mean, a, a, you know, of deeply researched work based on a lot of interviews, um, how quick it comes out. On the other hand, you know, in such a short amount of time, this, the, the scene has changed quite dramatically. Um, so what kind of responses now, you know, are you getting on the U.S. side um, to the book uh, coming out at this particular moment when it seems that all that work might be possibly quickly undone. So one of the things that I thought was I had no control over mm -hmm. is that this issue became so politicized. Mm -hmm. So I knew writing a story that clearly was in favor of doing the deal and explain, I, I think I addressed the other side quite well in the book, but nevertheless I have my own opinion. Uh, would always have a difficulty when it came to some of the folks that are completely opposed to it and are not willing to hear a different perspective. Mm -hmm. But that's unfortunately become the case for so many different, different mm -hmm. issues we're dealing with today. Um, so that, that challenge um, definitely was there. But I think perhaps one thing that people have been a bit surprised by is that why didn't you change the title of the book? Mm -hmm. It says Losing an Enemy. Uh, and my answer is because I never said lost an enemy. Mm -hmm. I said losing an enemy. It was an active tense. It's a process. It was unfinished. Mm -hmm. My argument, and I explain it in detail in the end of the book, is that this created an opportunity to lose an enemy. Mm -hmm. Whether we will lose an enemy or not depends on what we do with this opportunity. Right, right, right. I fear that we have decided to forego this opportunity at this point. But that's part of the point of the book. The point is that this enmity was always resolvable. Mm -hmm. The question is, did we want to resolve it? Did the other side want to resolve it? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that became quite clear with this nuclear deal is that the political opposition to it and to the idea of a deal that would actually put the U.S. on a path towards losing Iran as an enemy, the political opposition to it was stronger in Washington than it was in Tehran. Mm -hmm. Not to say that there weren't problems in Tehran, 
but it was a bigger fight in Congress than it was in Iran. You didn't have members of the Iranian parliament send a letter to President Obama saying, don't mind striking a deal with Rouhani because we're going to reverse whatever he signs mm -hmm. as soon as he's out of office. But you had 47 American uh, senators send that letter to the Supreme Leader of Iran mm -hmm. in an unprecedented move. Mm -hmm. uh, or invite Bibi Netanyahu to come and give a speech against the deal in the U.S. Congress speaking against the President of the United States. And I think what it showed was that for so long we had this notion that the reason why U.S.-Iran relations don't get resolved is because of this ideological opposition to it in Iran. That it would go against the very tenure, one of the main pillars of the Islamic revolution if they ever struck a deal with the US. There may have been some truth to it, but it also concealed our role in this. That there were actually a lot of opponents on this side towards any type of reconciliation with the Islamic Republic. And that came out in the open. And with the election of Trump, I think not only did it come out in the open, they took the driving seat. And now we're in the process of reversing many of these um, advances that were made. Now you do a great job of showing, you know, in the opening uh, scenes, for example, of how the pressures that can be put on both sides mm. by certain kinds of what seems to a non-diplomatic reader, small differences in the way that one talks. So you tell the story about a number of uh, U.S. members of the U.S. Navy, you know, b trying to do maintenance on their ship, ending up in Iranian waters, and what could have been uh, a major diplomatic uh, crisis that would last, you know, weeks if not months, gets resolved by some very subtle conversations uh, and using the right words and so on. You show that on both sides. So absolutely, what's, yeah. you know, when, when did you tell that? T tell yeah, that so story you had you know? these yeah. ten American sailors who were on a routine mission from, um, I think it was from Bahrain to Kuwait or Kuwait to Bahrain. A whole series of mistakes that they committed. And, and things that were out of their control. They ended up having mechanical problems. They had problems with their navigation systems. So they had to cannibalize one of their boats in order to rescue some parts and try to get the other boat to work. They knew they were lost. They just didn't know how far they were lost. And it ended up that they were actually inside of Iranian waters. And these are armed American Navy uh, sailors. So the Iranian Revolutionary Guards come there. They arrest them. Uh, there was a moment in which one of them thought that they might be able to fight their way out of it, but they also recognized that if they did, they could likely have caused a war because tensions were so high and it was so tense. Um, and I tell the story, you know, the Iranian foreign minister was just coming out of the theater in Tehran and he was on his way to the office because he had a scheduled call mm -hmm. with John Kerry because just a couple of days later they were supposed to have the first day of the nuclear deal coming into effect. And he gets a call from the Deputy National Security Advisor who explains to him that what had happened, this is about four hours after. And already by then, the Iranians had concluded that this was based on a mistake on the American side. This was not an effort to try to invade Iran or anything like that. With like they, they knew it was a mistake. Then they, they knew guess, it was yeah. a mistake. Yeah. But the question, how do you resolve this delicately? Yeah. Yeah. And Zarif's calculation was that he quickly needed to talk to the American side and say, Essentially, let's resolve this quickly. Um, you, it was a mistake. Just apologize. Don't make any threats. Because if you make threats, the Iranians are going to respond with threats, and this whole thing is going to escalate out of control. And something that could be resolved in a couple of hours could take on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. Kerry was of the same mind. And in fact, when you take a look back, it's quite astonishing. The Pentagon went out and mm -hmm. said, this was our fault. They even said the Iranians are handling it professionally, etc. Mm -hmm. It was very clear. They also recognize this could be resolved if we just lower the temperature mm -hmm. and do not make any threats of saying mm -hmm. they must be released or else or anything like that. And in fact, by the second phone call, Zarif and Kerry had five phone calls during that night. Mm -hmm. By the second phone call, they already had a deal. Mm -hmm. it was, the rest of it was just about the implementation. Right. And that was because by then, they had spent so much time with each other. Yeah. They had such a strong relationship that a crisis could not be capitalized on by the hardliners yeah. on either side. Yeah. And they got released, and the big victory here is that most Americans don't even know about this. Right. Had this gone the other way, and it would have been a major crisis, we could potentially have seen a second hostage crisis in which the Americans might have been held for, for days and days, perhaps even years. Instead, precisely because the U.S. had a channel to mm. the Iranians, an issue of this kind was resolved in 16 hours. Mm. No one got, got harmed. 
Unfortunately, the IRGC in Iran tried to score some propaganda points and they took some bad pictures of them and forced them to hold their hands. You know, there were some bad things that happened as well. But at the end of the day, they were all released mm. within 16 hours. Just compare that to what happened about a decade earlier. Uh, similar mistake. Mm. Some British sailors got into Iranian waters. They got arrested. The Iranians kept them for two weeks. And it wasn't until Tony Blair essentially was begging mm. that they got released. But they still got released, but it took two weeks. Mm. Imagine if this had happened. The president didn't have two weeks mm. because this was only five or six days right. Uh, yeah. till uh, the next president would come in. Yeah. So this could have ended up really, really badly, yeah. but because of the strength of diplomacy got resolved. Now, reading that and hearing the story today, it seems like a, like a completely different era yeah. in the idea of um, how you know, a series of phone calls in the course of mm. the day could resolve something. But we're, mm. you know, the technologies have not actually changed very much, and yet mm. we feel we're in a moment in which you know, political speech from our leaders can escalate all sorts of situations have nothing to do with Iran very yeah. quickly. Um, what kind of responses are you getting from Iran about of this book, uh, about the book right now? Is, have you heard anything? Uh, have you got any direct connection? I have that? not heard much, yeah. uh, except for the fact that I think from the people that I've heard who have been in the administration on both sides, uh, it's mainly been positive. I think on the American side, there is perhaps a bit of. Um, uh, they may not entirely agree with my analysis about what the role of the sanctions was. Mm. And I think that's understandable. Uh, I don't think any superpower would like to have its coercive instruments questioned. Mm. Um, but overall... Um, you say a little bit more about that. You, you, yeah. you argue in the book that the sanctions... To say, say what you yeah, think essentially, the I mean, the, the, the narrative that is out there, yeah. which has been, you know, supported by Republicans and Democrats, is that the sanctions were so painful for the Iranians that thanks to that pain, they came essentially crawling to the negotiating mm -hmm. table. Um, it's a very common narrative. I didn't find much evidence for it in reality, however, mm -hmm. particularly when you take a look at what was happening in the secret negotiations, mm -hmm. you see a very, very different picture. Mm -hmm. And you see that while the sanctions were extremely painful, mm -hmm. it hurt the Iranian economy. It did not hurt the Iranian nuclear program. In fact, the Iranian strategy was to double down on the nuclear program in response to the sanctions. I had the chief of staff of Rouhani explain it in detail, saying the idea was to break the mentality of the other side. By having sanctions lead to more centrifuges, they were trying to convince the United States that coercion would only lead to a bigger nuclear program. Right. And then the question was, OK, which one of these clocks ticks the fastest? Is it the sanctions clock in trying to essentially cripple the Iranian economy? Or is it the nuclear clock in which the Iranians are trying to present a nuclear fait accompli to the United States? Reality is, it was the nuclear clock that ticked the fastest. Mm -hmm. Because the Iranians advanced so fast that the Iranian breakout capability started to be measured in weeks, mm -hmm. which meant that the window for even taking military action started to shrink significantly. Mm -hmm. At that point, it was early January 2013, the president realized that unless something changed, the only options the U.S. would be faced with would be either taking military action or acquiescing to Iran being a de facto mm -hmm. nuclear power. The only thing that could change was that the U.S. would go back to the negotiating table mm -hmm. in Oman secretly and give the Iranians what was the main concession the U.S. could give, acceptance that Iran will have enrichment. It was just about how do we limit it rather than trying to eliminate it, which was the key thing the Iranians were looking for. So the key thing was, yeah, to, to as you call it in the book, to acknowledge that red line. That, and everyone Iran knew that. Enrich, enrich, everyone enrich. knew that. Yeah. Even the Obama administration knew they were going to play that card, yeah. but they thought they would play it at the end of the negotiation because it was the biggest yeah. bargaining card the U.S. had. Yeah. You would use it at the end, not in the beginning. But precisely because the sanctions clock actually didn't yeah. work the way that they were hoping for, they had to play it in the beginning yeah. in order to even get negotiations. And then when you compare the details of this deal, which again, I think it's the best deal that could have been achieved at the time, but if you compare it to the offers that were on the table mm -hmm. 10 years earlier, before all of these sanctions, the Iranian program had not advanced mm -hmm. at all in comparison. I mean, it was much, much smaller, with far less knowledge about the fuel cycle. Mm -hmm. But at that moment, the U.S. was not interested mm -hmm. in accepting enrichment. They were mm -hmm. pursuing, in my view, a very unrealistic approach. And I argue that if we had had a much more realistic approach much earlier, mm -hmm. we could have settled for a much smaller Iranian nuclear program, short of going down the road of all of these different sanctions. And I think we have to 
look at this, the analysis cannot be just a year and a half of negotiation. It has yeah. to be for the duration of this deal. We could have gotten a much stronger deal much earlier if we had a much more realistic position from the outset. Instead, we pursued um, an approach that was really centered on pressure, mm -hmm. combined with re very unrealistic objectives. And this is what ended up happening, which is that the Iranians gained more time rather than the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly important with how we deal with North Korea today. I'm really hoping we don't commit that mistake again. Because with North Korea, we have even smaller margins than we have with Iran. Let's, um, let's talk about how perceptions on both sides of, of, uh, of Americans towards Iran and Iranians towards uh, America kind of play into uh, the way these decisions get made. Um, you know, I, I've found in my own time, you know, I've, I've written both about American what we sometimes call orientalism or mm -hmm. attitudes towards Iran that are sometimes based on um, popular culture or film or literature, mm -hmm. things that are far from what seems to be the hard world of geopolitics, and on Iranian perceptions of the United States too, but, and, and experienced them a number of times in Iran. Um, you know, how, how do you find, or do you find, that sometimes the stereotypes about the others, about, from an Iranian perspective to the U.S. and vice versa, play into moments um, that would seem to be Absolutely. Uh, apart from them. Yeah. Absolutely. I would say, first of all, prior to getting to the negotiating table, a lot of these, whether it is stereotypes or whether it is false narratives and assumptions, um, many of them politically motivated, were very effective in even preventing diplomacy from taking place in the first place. Mm -hmm. So when arguments are being made, there are actually not arguments that were essentially presented as conclusions, the Iranians are irrational. Mm -hmm. They are suicidal. Well, if you have a, an opponent that you believe is both irrational and suicidal, first of all, you're not going to be pursuing diplomacy, nor can you pursue deterrence, because deterrence requires a degree of rationality on the other side that they actually may cause benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. The fact that then they are also considered to be suicidal means that they're eventually going to attack you. So your only option left is to take preemptive strikes. Mm -hmm. So some of these assumptions I don't think were, uh, or conclusions were presented naively. I think they were presented very much with the calculation of driving the United States away from diplomacy and towards uh, preventive, uh, preemptive military strikes. Mm -hmm. And um, they were very powerful and it made it very difficult in Washington to, for someone to argue we need to have diplomacy. Right. It's like diplomacy with who? You know, they're not rational, you can't right. negotiate with them, you can't talk to them, etc creating all of these mythologies. And the same thing issue existed on the Iranian side. It wasn't necessarily as much mythologies as it was just a taboo period to suggest that you could and you should talk to the United States. That was more the case earlier in the 2000s. Mm. But these things were very problematic. It took quite some time and an effort from the, Trump, uh, from the Obama administration to break that down and, uh, and essentially say at the end of the day, uh, we have to give diplomacy a chance instead of getting in, involved in these debates as to whether the Iranians are rational or not. Well, what's, I mean, you know, I mean, I've heard a number of times in Iran, um, you know, they're added, there's an idea that Americans are untrustworthy um, yeah. because of our own, our own political history in, in Iran. I mean, how does that work on the Iranian side? You know, it worked in such a way so that uh, Khamenei never came out in complete embrace of the negotiations. He said, I support this, but mark my words, the Americans are not trustworthy. They're going to betray this agreement sooner or later. So he kept his distance, a calculated distance, so that he wouldn't be, uh, you know, faulted once this would collapse. And unfortunately, within two years now, we have the Trump administration turning against the, mm -hmm. the deal. So it has led to a scenario inside of Iran in which a lot of people feel that the hardline narrative on the United States so, may have been true. So if the American, you know, stereotype about Iran is often that they're suicidal or... Or, you know, there, what is the Iranian, what's there, the there's there's Iranian? On, on the Iranian side, it's so. usually, or at least it was up until a couple of years ago, an overestimation of the United States. Yeah. That the United States is, is more powerful than it is, and that the United States is behind every conspiracy that is taking mm -hmm. place in the region. Mm -hmm. So they, they saw the hands of the U.S. behind everything that happened. You know, many of those things had nothing to do with the U.S. and may have gone completely against the interests of the U.S., but the Iranians are putting two and two together and coming up with five. Mm -hmm. On the American side, it was the opposite. We were mm -hmm. underestimating them. They're not even rational to begin with. They're suicidal. Anything we don't understand about them, we explain with ideology. We didn't even know what ideology was. But we put that in that catch-all mm -hmm. type of variable. 
I think one of the interesting things that happened in the negotiations, particularly once Rouhani came in and changed the team, is that the two sides started humanizing each other. Mm -hmm. And you saw that in some of the early rounds of the negotiations in, in Geneva in 2013, uh, Zarif is showing up um, in, in a wheelchair mm -hmm. because he had a horrible back, major difficulties. And many of the sessions were starting off with the different sides, you know, sharing experience and, and tips on how to deal with back pain because everyone had suffered from it one way or another mm. uh, and getting to know each other, talk about their mm. families, etc. And I think that helped a lot and in a way that none, no one would like to admit, it also created a bit of, I don't want to call it unity, but at times it became that they were working together against the opponents of the deal on both sides. Mm -hmm. They were trying to f get something done, they knew it could be done and they're Opponents on the one hand was the counterparts that were bargaining so hard, but in a way they were also their partners mm -hmm. because they needed to succeed together. They could only succeed together. They could not succeed alone. Mm -hmm. And their success together would also mean that they would be successful against their domestic political detractors. But obviously politically no one could yeah. admit that or even hint at anything yeah. like that. But you could sense that there was a bit of, and also what many of them did admit that is they started to understand and express a degree of empathy of, and sympathy for the domestic political problems of the other side. Yeah. And for the American side in particular, I think this was important because their learning curve was much, much steeper than the Iranian learning curve. In the sense that the Iranians understood much more about American politics than the American side understood about Iranian politics by virtue of the fact well, that, that yeah. well, I mean, Zarif has spent half his life in yeah. the United States, yeah. right? Whereas on the- But I mean, just in a general level, I mean, uh, you know, I found that people in Iran are paying attention to American media, course. American entertainment, television. Of course, all of these different facts. So definitely, no one here is paying that yeah. much attention to Iranian politics amongst ordinary people, but yeah. everyone in the world is following U.S. politics yeah. because it has a degree of entertainment value yeah. uh, to see what Trump is doing, etc. Yeah. You know, so what are the kinds of pressures now, you know, in the Trump administration? You're giving a talk uh, in, in a little while about the pressures that the Trump administration puts on the deal and whether Trump will end the deal. What are the responses, you know, what are the pressures that are put on the Rouhani and the Iranian administration by the election of, of Donald Trump to the presidency? Um, so it really changed um, everyone's calculations in a way. I don't think anyone had expected this. I think uh, the Iranians were getting ready for a Hillary victory and they were worried about it because they had some bad history with her. Um, and I think some may have even naively thought that perhaps the Trump administration would be better for them simply because they didn't understand where Trump was coming from and they thought he's a businessman so he's going to be pragmatic etc. But it has put a tremendous amount of pressure on, on the Rouhani government because even before Trump came in there were a lot of parts of the sanctions relief on the American side that wasn't working. Mm -hmm. The United States is very effective in imposing sanctions but has very little experience in lifting sanctions. Mm -hmm. We usually don't even lift sanctions. Most of the sanctions we impose hardly ever get lifted. And it led to a scenario, particularly because there was a question mark about the durability of the deal. Mm -hmm. Everyone wanted to see who the next president of the United States was before they were willing to, for banks to come in and, uh, and finance projects in Iran. And that's important for the Iranians because they need to deal with the unemployment issue. Now, unemployment issue is only going to get effectively addressed once you have investments coming in. Just being able to sell oil mm -hmm. or to trade doesn't create jobs. It's right. investments that create jobs. They've had very little investment compared to what they expected and what most people expected to get because banks are not willing to finance the deals because for them to finance these deals, some of these projects are 15 years long. They need to have the confidence that this deal is going to be in place for 15 years mm -hmm. and not be reversed by the next president or the next Congress, etc. So even before Trump came in, this was an issue. Now when Trump is in, it's become an even bigger issue. And the Rouhani camp was afraid that they was going to lose the presidential election precisely because the general population feel that the deal has not delivered to them what it was supposed to deliver yeah. because the sanctions relief hasn't worked. Yeah. Um, and in a couple of elections in a row now, the Rouhani government has benefited from the fact that people at the end of the day have decided to choose the lesser evils. Even though they're disappointed with Rouhani, they did not want to see hardliners take over and see Iran return to the Ahmadinejad years. So they keep on electing and re-electing mm -hmm. uh, Rouhani and his uh, allies. But the question mark, how long will they do so, particularly if 
the Trump administration completely walks out of the deal and starts reimposing sanctions. So um, what, what then, um, you know, we talked earlier about the ways in which careful diplomatic language or careful conversation uh, helped steer through some very difficult waters in the uh, Zarif and John Kerry kind of conversations. What now uh, with a president who's known to, be, to have kind of impulsive tweeting, as you mentioned earlier, or, or speak with a certain kind of voice that's either meant to provoke um, knowingly or unknowingly provoke people, what kind of pressure does that put on Iran right now for their part of, the, of this uh, deal and bargain? I would say that I think they have played their cards pretty cleverly. On the one hand, this is not good for them and for the future of the deal. On the other hand, it, is, it does present them with some opportunities. First of all, by keeping a very low profile, they're coming across as the reasonable party, uh, and Trump is coming across as the unreasonable party. Uh, and this is helping them in many different ways. Their conversations with the Europeans are very different now as a result of the Europeans being very opposed to what Trump is doing. And this is one of the big things for them. Throughout this entire period, they were always hoping to be able to separate the Europeans from the United States. The United States' ability to isolate and contain Iran is significantly more powerful when the US and the EU are on the same page. And they failed to separate the U.S. from Europe throughout the negotiations. Now, however, Trump is doing the work for them. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about the deal. It's about the direction of the United States on the global stage as the leader of the global uh, liberal order uh, and the sense on the European side that that's not where the U.S. is any longer. It's not just the Iran deal. It's Paris Agreement. It's NATO. It's UNESCO. Mm -hmm. Listen to what the German foreign minister just recently said, in which he said, the European-American relationship will never go back to what it was before. Mm -hmm. Because what we're seeing now coming out of the United States is not limited to Trump. This has deeper roots. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very profound statement from the Germans, mm -hmm. one of the closest allies of the United States. Mm -hmm. This, I think, the Iranians are enjoying very much. It's going to be much easier for them to make sure that the U.S. can never assemble the same type of a alliance against Iran, mm -hmm. um, particularly as the they are patching up their own relations, they're living up to the nuclear deal, and the Europeans are quite happy with them about those things. So I think they're also taking advantage of the damage Trump is doing to the United States by creating such rifts between the U.S. and many of its core allies. You know, one of the things that the, the book does very nicely in setting the stage for the deal itself is to describe how the, um, how the 1991 becomes a turning point in the region, and as you show, you know, with the, with the defeat of Saddam Hussein in that first Gulf War um, and the end of the Soviet Union's kind of, you know, the, the end of the Cold War with mm. the collapse of the Soviet Union, it changes the dynamics in the region quite dramatically. Over the last, uh, well, last week, first of all, the week before this conversation as that we're having, uh, Trump uh, announced that, uh, that he was going to uh, moved the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem, and that Jerusalem was, after all, the capital of Israel. You know, and again, that following his comments in Saudi Arabia and the kind of blockade on Qatar seems to be changing the dynamics once again in the Middle East um, that would very much affect Iran. How do you know how profound moving away from including Iran, but moving away from it specifically? How profound do you see this? I, I think it's. it's I think it's uh, the Jerusalem move, of course has significant political ramifications. It doesn't alter the balance of power in the region. The alliance between Israel and Saudi Arabia, which is increasingly in the open, um, and has been there for a while, but never as open as clear cut as it is now, I don't think is altering the balance of power. What it does is that it is ensuring that the Israelis and the Saudis are working more closely together to get the United States to recommit itself to the region militarily, mm -hmm. something that the Obama administration deliberately wanted to reduce mm -hmm. in order to be able to pivot to Asia. Mm -hmm. If that succeeds, that will definitely have a major impact on the balance of power in the region. I personally don't believe, even if they manage to convince the United States to go in that direction, I personally don't believe that it will succeed in a long term of shifting the balance in a, diff in a decisive way. Because I don't think it is in the interest of the United States to go that route. And I think even if it happens now, it would relatively soon be reversed. Mm -hmm. 
there are some gravitational forces of geopolitics that is completely indifferent to the viewpoints of Donald Trump or anyone else. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later, the United States and everyone else will be forced to adjust to those forces. Mm -hmm. And one of those forces is going to be shifting the United States further and further away from this type of a deep hegemonic position in the Middle East. So, but what the political ramifications of Jerusalem is, is I think it is once again providing the Iranians with an opening that they could not have created on their own. Mm -hmm. They have tried very hard to try to make, um, utilize this very venomous rhetoric against Israel, a very strong position against Israel, in order to position themselves as the leader of the Muslim world, as the forefront uh, fan bearers of the Palestinian cause. This was aimed to limit the Persian Arab division, the Shia Sunni divisions. Mm -hmm. And it was to a certain extent successful because there were moments in which the Iranians were very popular in the Arab streets mm -hmm. because the Arab masses were feeling that their own governments were completely helpless. Mm -hmm. But the Iranians and Hezbollah were um, more potent. That changed with the invasion, with the uh, civil war in Syria in which the Iranians were on the side of Assad, and mm -hmm. which the Saudis were much more successful in making the case that Iran is a problem, that Iran is butchering uh, Sunnis, etc. Mm -hmm. And so the Sunni-Shia prism became much more mm -hmm. accepted in the region as a result of Syria. Mm -hmm. And Syria, and the regional conversation didn't become Palestine, mm -hmm. it became Syria. Mm -hmm. And this was a major problem for the Iranians because they were themselves uncomfortable with their positions supporting Assad, at least in the beginning. Once ISIS emerged, you could see that the debate in Iran also shifted away and, and they also, even the critics started to become more in line with Iran's support for Assad. But they were hoping to be able to shift the conversation back to Palestine because that's where they have stronger cards and they could put the Saudis on the defensive. Mm -hmm. And their attempts were very limited and very unsuccessful. But then suddenly Trump decides to make this move without asking mm -hmm. anything of return from the Israelis. And now once again, the regional conversation mm -hmm. is about Palestine, mm -hmm. not about Syria. And this is giving the Iranians the opening that they had been looking for, that they themselves could not have created. So an inadvertent uh, win for Iran in terms of that? So that many of the wins of Iran in the last 15 years have been a direct result of American mistakes rather mm -hmm. than very clever Iranian plays. Now, uh, in, in, that, in, in that discussion there, with, you know, I'm really interested in the ways in which the people, you know, as much as one can talk about them, in Iran, in the United States, relate to the leadership and mm. the diplomatic decisions that are being made here. Um, let's talk for a moment about you know the Iranian diaspora in mm. the United States. I mean, you're the the chair of the National Iranian American Council, NIAC, um, and of course the Iranian diaspora in the United States and, and transnationally has been you know a major force and a, and a and really taken a position that is often critical of Iran and the Iranians are critical of them. How um, do you see in the, in the Iranian-American community in the United States responses to Trump now, uh, you know, undoing or speaking yeah. against uh, Obama's deal? So it, it's been very interesting to see how the Iranian-American community have started to politically mature in the United States. I mean, 15, 20 years ago, it was deliberately keeping a very low profile. And in the last couple of elections, they've started to make use of one of the strong cards they have, which is very financially strong. So they've many very senior uh, fundraisers, etc. One of the false impressions that have existed is that a lot of people thought that the Iranian American community is very similar to the Cuban American community, mm. meaning that they're exiled and they hold such strong bad blood against the regime, so they're in favor of sanctions and a confrontational mm. approach. Without a doubt, there was a small segment of the community that held those views, but it was also the segment of the community that owned all the megaphones. So that was the voices people were hearing for a very long time. So we're we talking about the kind of the Tehranjalis? The Tehranjalis, exactly. And, and Oftentimes, phones include some of those channels and uh, Channels, but media. also because they were, you know, they came with money and as a result they had more access and they were much more confident in speaking up. I mean, um, it was very difficult to make an argument for diplomacy with Iran because the overwhelming majority of Iranian Americans are not particularly fond of this regime. I mean, right. the reason why they're here is precisely because they're not fond of that right. regime. But I think the Iraq war kind of gave the majority, which actually was in favor of diplomacy, despite the fact they don't like the regime, a bit more courage to speak out because suddenly it started to become clear 
the confrontational policy is not going to destroy the regime, it's going to destroy the country. And if you actually are opposed to the regime because you want to see democracy, then it would also be logical for you to make sure that the path you choose doesn't lead to the country being destroyed so that it doesn't matter if there's democracy or not, there's no country left. So after the experience of Iraq and Afghanistan, you definitely saw that the silent majority started to become less silent and they were willing to speak out. They did not want to see war. They were skeptical about sanctions. They wanted diplomacy, but they also wanted that human rights would be addressed. They didn't want to see the United States go back to the relationship it had with the Shah in which it was all about security and human rights was a, a footnote at best, or the current relationship the United States tends to have with almost everyone else in the Middle East, in which human rights is definitely, at, at least there's a degree of honesty in the Trump administration, they don't even pretend to care about human rights. But that maturity led to a scenario in which the nuclear deal, once it was struck, it was overwhelmingly popular in the Iranian-American community. Very, very popular. Um, and I think it still is because the alternative of war is, is such, such a small majority supporting it. The difference is not that the opinions have shifted so much. The difference is that the silent majority has become a little bit more mature and more willing to speak their minds instead of just being silenced by the minority. With Trump, it was interesting because no one knew exactly what was going to happen. No one knew if they could take anything he said seriously or risk not taking it seriously. But it took only about 10 days, I would say, before opinions started to um, cement in the, in the community. And that was because of the Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. I mean, but what he did with the Muslim ban 10 days into his presidency in the manner it was done, mm -hmm. in which visas were retroactively taken away from people, uh, people traveling with green cards were held, uh, and you know, some were not let back into the country, at least at not first. And the fact that this was overwhelmingly affecting Iranian Americans, that, that was the majority of the group of people being affected mm -hmm. by this. Mindful of the fact that 94.1% of all terror-related deaths on U.S. soil committed by foreign nationals have been committed by nationals of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the UAE, mm -hmm. and they're not on the list, but Iran is. Mm -hmm. uh, it really created a sense that this, uh, this administration is going very aggressively against the Iranian-American community and um, that the opening for dialogue had been closed by the Trump administration. Um, so, you know, with the scene that you've set, um, you know, we, as I said, we look back nostalgically, but also hopefully on, on the Iran deal that you described so well in the book. What, looking ahead over the, over the course of the winter to come and, the, and into the spring, um, are the main things that you're watching for to see if we might there might be a pivot away from the kind of uh, corner that, that the president seems to have talked himself into. Well, the first thing is to see if the president renews the waivers. I mean, there is a risk that if he doesn't do that uh, by mid-January, the United States would be out of compliance of the deal. And that would potentially trigger a process that would call the deal to entirely collapse. That would be a very dangerous thing. I think it's very critical that members of the public communicate with their members of Congress about this issue because a vote in favor of new sanctions or other things that could kill the deal could have the same political repercussions and geopolitical repercussions as the vote that Congress cast in favor of giving George W. Bush, Bush uh, authority to use force against Iraq. It is essentially a vote for war. And that's part of the reason why there's been almost no progress with this bill in Congress so far, because members of Congress are not going to cast that vote. They, they may not oppose that war, but they don't want to be responsible for it. So it, we're we're entering a very pivotal moment in which if we want to make sure that we don't go back into a mode of war in the region, particularly with a powerful country like Iran, the public needs to be more engaged and involved in this conversation. All right. Well, Trader Parsi, thanks for taking the time to talk to Thank us. Thank you for Again, having the me. The book is Losing the Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. And as you can see from our discussion, uh, it's not only a story about this uh, historic deal, but also offer, offers a kind of an argument for a model of and mode of engagement that seems very crucial for the uh, history to come that we're all making. So thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much.